Um, I would first like to thank the organizers for inviting me to this uh, wonderful conference. This is my first time in the UK. I'm very excited to be here. Um, so I'll be talking to you about microad structure determination of protein crystals by fragment-based molecular replacement. Um, so I'll first give you just the different flavors of cryo-EM. Um, single particle is um, a cryotransmission electron microscopy and imaging method um, in which digitized images of particles are combined to form a representative image with more highly interpretable features and greater signal-to-noise ratio. Um, tomography is another imaging method in which your sample is being rotated and many 2D classes are combined to form a 3D reconstruction. Um, electron crystallography is um, a diffraction method and in which 2D crystals, in the case of this membrane protein, or um, 3D crystals are loaded on the stage of a microscope and the interaction between electrons in your sample um, producing a diffraction pattern on your detector. Uh, when your crystals are ordered in three dimensions, then the diffraction technique is termed microelectron diffraction. Uh, MicroEd requires protein nanocrystals, which are initially grown and optimized as microcrystals in 24 well hanging drop experiments. In the top left here, you see needles actually grown from a human prion peptide. And A, B, and C show different morphologies of microcrystals. They're rhomboid, rhomboid shaped and brick shaped, and again, needles. Um, and in order to kind of better visualize nanocrystals, we image them using transmission electron microscopy. And these are actually overlaid on a holy carbon grid. The width of each hole is approximately one micron. Um, and the size scale is actually difficult to see because these, these nanocrystals are covered in water. But in um, E, F, and G, you can clearly see these rhomboids and these bricks and the needle here. So the width of this needle is um, much, it's much smaller than the width of the whole. In fact, protein nanocrystals are generally less than half a micron in diameter and no more than a couple microns in length. Um, it's important to distinguish between needles and fibers. Um, fibers, oftentimes suitable samples, are collections of well-ordered fibers. And in, in these TEM images taken from a peptide with sequence GSAQAA, you can actually see this fibrous material attached to a more crystalline rod. Um, and, and needles actually are characterized by having long crystalline lengths, very straight edges, whereas fibers can have bends and twists um, and, and are not straight. Um, although I'll be focusing on electron diffraction, protein nanocrystals can also be interrogated by, um, as we've heard, synchrotron X-rays and X-ray free electron lasers. Um, synchrotron X-rays, um, as you all know, are the um, continuous intermediate intensity source, thus requiring a relatively large sample size. Um, greater than a micron. Um, XFELs, um, because they emit very bright pulses at short intervals, the sample size can be much smaller on the order of 100 nanometers. Um, and because electrons interact with uh, matter much more strongly than do photons, no pulsing is required. And the sample size can also be very small on the order of 100 to 500 nanometers. The primary difference between electrons and X-rays is that First, because the wavelength of electrons is on the order of 100 times smaller than that for X-rays, the Ewald sphere is much bigger. So in this panel on the left, you see on the left-hand side, you can and see the curve, the curvature of, this, of the Ewald sphere. So upon performing continuous rotation, the intersection of the Ewald sphere with your reciprocal lattice gives um, spots in your diffraction pattern falling along loons. Um, whereas for electrons, the Ewald sphere, we're sampling the same area of reciprocal space, so the Ewald sphere is, is nearly flat. Um, and when we do continuous rotation, the intersection of the Ewald sphere with um, the reciprocal lattice gives spots falling along lines. Um, also, because electrons are charged, they can interact with the nucleus and also the electron cloud, and um, for this reason, they offer a much greater signal attained from your sample. Um, and, and lastly, electrons are focused using electromagnetic lenses. Here I present a brief history of microed. In 2013, the Gonin lab um, determined the first protein structure of lysozyme. Um, and three years later, the Eisenberg lab actually determined the structure of um, a segment of a protein responsible for Parkinson's disease, alpha-synuclein. And uh, um, a couple months later, the Gonin lab again determined the structure of protonase K. Um, and very recently, this past year, the Rodriguez lab determined the sub-Ongstrom structure of the bankful prion segment. Um, which I'll talk a little about later. So for these three protein structures, they were actually phased by molecular replacement. Um, in the rare cases where um, atomic resolution electron diffraction data is attained, then direct methods is an amenable phasing method. Um, so here I'll be focusing on um, 
an electron diffraction data set of protonase K. You can see protonase K nanocrystals overlaid on a holy carbon grid, um, indicated by this yellow arrow, and um, we put together a nice diffraction, a movie of diffraction patterns, along with a representative, representative image showing diffraction out to 1.7 angstroms. Um, and using the uh, microed um, data collection techniques, along with molecular replacement phasing and adjusting the atomic coordinates to better fit the diffraction data, a final model of protonase K was determined. Um, in fact, molecular replacement is the method used for the majority of microed structures determined to date. Um, as we know, it, a limitation is that it relies on a known homologous structure. Um, experimental phasing with heavy atom derivatives has not successfully been performed, likely because the difference in signal attained from the heavy atoms in your sample is much smaller than it is for x-rays. Um, and in, in the few cases, as I mentioned before, where you have atomic resolution data extending to less than one angstrom, um, then direct methods is amenable. And here is actually an example of a direct method structure using microED. So we took crystals of a peptide with this amino acid sequence, um, and we optimized these crystals and obtained diffraction. We then merged um, the integrated intensities from nine diffraction data sets to a single diffraction data set, actually extending to 0.75 angstrom resolution. Um, and then upon implementing um, 50,000 Shellex trials um, and taking the solution with the highest combined figure of merit, we obtained the ab initio shown in B, um, and then refining with hydrogens gave us the final solution um, resolved to 0.75 angstroms. Um, so many microed data sets are um, not amenable by molecular replacement or um, by standard molecular replacement or direct methods phasing. So um, this is either because there's, um, we don't have atomic resolution data um, or there's no previously known homologous structure. So then we turn to um, a fragment-based molecular replacement approach, um, which was nicely outlined by Massimo and Claudia. Uh, but the general workflow is that a large fragment library is created from a shredded model, which can share low sequence identity with your target. Um, and rotation search is performed, and rotation clusters are generated, um, followed by successive molecular replacement runs um, on the rotation clusters, which, which have been stripped down to polyalanine models, um, as Paula mentioned. And, and um, following density modification and auto tracing, um, if the correlation coefficient is, is greater than 30%, then the structure is marked as solved. Otherwise, um, it loops back to the next rotation cluster. Um, so we focused on a 1.6 angstrom protonase K electron diffraction data set, um, and um, the statistics are shown here. Um, uh, one kind of um, consistent input that we used for shredder was a sequential shred um, in which we took 10 to 14 residues with five steps between starting residues and then extracted these, um, search, these um, shreds as search fragments. Um, and so initially when we obtained the Archimbaldo output, we attempted to manually build in the rest of the model. This was actually very difficult because um, it gave us a partial model with maybe 70% um, of the residues. And we, we looked for landmarks like um, bulky tryptophans or tyrosine, tyrosine, tyrosine motifs. Um, and so we attempted to kind of speed this process up, um, as Paula discussed a little bit, using this um, a protocol here in which we perform an initial Archimbaldo shredder run and then a refinement in Phoenix and then immediately proceed to auto build in Buccaneer, um, which I'll show later. And um, following uh, minimal manual loop modeling, then a final solution was um, obtained. So we, um, this is a first test. Um, it was a control test where we just took a 1.6 angstrom protonase K electron diffraction data set um, and, and just the x-ray structure of protonase K as the MR probe. Um, so these 10 fragments are the initial Archimbaldo output, um, each colored a different color. It found about 70% of the residues. Um, and, upon, and upon putting into Buccaneer, then it was able to connect every fragment um, and also extend this helix shown here. And as you can see, this output clearly um, closely models the final structure. So it was, it was very trivial to actually get to the final structure, just adding in 51 water molecules. And um, um, the second test we performed was with, a, with again, the 1.6 angstrom protonase K electron diffraction data set with um, a 50% homologous structure. This is actually a, a cuticle degrading protease as the search probe. Um, and the output showed eight fragments, uh, which I colored a different color, and it found about the same number of residues. Um, and upon implementing in Buccaneer, we found it was able to add in this blue helix um, and this, this gray strand, and also this loop connecting this helix to the strand. Um, 
And so from here, we just had to connect the remaining fragments and perform loop modeling to obtain the final structure. Um, here, I just wanted to outline some of the um, features Buckner was able to add. Um, in orange is the output from auto building, and in yellow is our initial Phoenix refined output. As you can see, it nicely placed in this tan beta strand. Um, the carboxy termini align well with the nitrogen termini of the strands above and below to form hydrogen bonds. Um, and Buckner was also able to add in this helix at the end of, of chain c of fragment C. Um, and to accomplish and the more complicated task of loop modeling, we can see Buccaneer built this um, loop, which actually connects to the helix um, previously, and also this um, small four residue loop connecting the small helix to a strand. Um, it's important to mention that I actually have to perform minimal loop modeling to get to the final structure. And um, in gray, you can see the final structure. So this um, connects a small helix to a strand. Um, and this loop, actually, with this tyrosine, tyrosine, tyrosine motif, um, connects a small strand to a helix. Um, so the third test we performed was using um, a truncated data set, um, a 1.8 angstrom truncated protonase K electron diffraction data set with, again, the cuticle degrading protease as the search model. Um, and the Archambaldo output showed 11 fragments, um, and it found about 65% of the residues. Um, upon it, putting in Buccaneer, we found it was able to uh, build in this yellow helix, um, this, this blue strand, and also this mini loop. Um, and um, it, was, it was relatively simple to get to our final structure um, by connecting, making seven connections, um, and, and getting our final structure. Um, so in conclusion, um, we determined microwed structures of a high completeness protonase K data set at 1.6 and 1.8 angstrom resolution by this fragment-based approach. Um, and demonstrated the use of Archambaldo Shredder coupled with Buccaneer for nearly automated protonase case structure determination. Um, um, I want to mention that in, in the lab, a graduate student has previously attempted um, these phasing tests using an amylo amylodogenic peptide. Um, he's currently trying to find parameters to uh, routinely achieve success by um, determining novel structures of peptides. Um, and also we look forward to an integration of electron scattering factors in the Shellac suite um, and performing an Archambaldo shredder phasing test using a completely non-homologous structure as a search model. Um, I believe that structure determination by this fragment-based molecular replacement may prove useful for micro data sets in the two angstrom to one angstrom range when a homologous structure is not known. I'd like to thank um, my mentor, Professor Jose Rodriguez, and Logan, um, the graduate student who's working on these tests with amyloidogenic peptides, and of course, everyone in his lab, and also David Eisenberg for many useful conversations, um, and Michael Swai and Duilo Cassio. I think Michael Swai was really instrumental in um, this project because his expertise in uh, model building and structure determination was very helpful. Um, and also Johan Hotney and Mike Martinowitz from the Tamir Gonin's lab um, for helping to collect and process the Protonase K data sets. And also um, Isabel Yusson and her postdoc Claudia for um, um, help introducing us to Archambaldo and helping us integrate it with um, electron diffraction data. Um, thank you for your attention.